So we're here in Tucson for the Science of Consciousness conference. And I'm here with Sir Roger Penrose, who is a professor at Oxford University, specializing in uh, mathematical physics and in particular relativity. Now, it's a pleasure to, for you to join us for this podcast. Um, perhaps we can begin with so this conference, The Science of Consciousness, uh, blossomed from your partnership with Stuart Hameroff, which initially came from your book, The Emperor's New Mind, which was a kind of a critique on artificial intelligence. And you didn't believe that through the computational methods they'd be able to achieve consciousness comparable to what humans perceive. Well, the argument was that well, humans, but it wasn't specific to humans. But the argument I was making had to do with um, understanding, and particularly mathematical understanding, because that's the sort of thing I knew about. And it's clear in mathematics and mathematical logic that we don't just follow computational rules. We have to understand what we're doing, and the understanding enables us to transcend whatever computational u rules we're using. And we have to know why those computational rules work, and when you know that, you can, you can transcend those rules. I mean, these things ca came from Gödel's theorem and various things which I learned um, when I was a graduate student. Um, but it seemed to me that since we, most of the, I mean, all the physics that we knew, basically, Newtonian mechanics, Maxwell's equations, um, general relativity, Einstein's equations, things like this, are basically computational, so you could imagine putting them on a computer. But the one gap in our understanding which could have relevance, it seemed to me, was in quantum mechanics itself. Although the procedures of quantum mechanics, when you say evolve the Schrodinger equation, are again of a computational nature, what you do with it is incompatible with the Schrodinger's equation. And this is well established as how quantum mechanics works. But you turn these things into probabilities and then you, that is a different procedure. So there's a kind of inconsistency in what one does. So you jump from these deterministic uh, computational activities and to something where you have to choose one out of selection. And what is it that governs that choice? And it seems to me that's the only place in physics which was relevant that there could be something outside computation. And so I took the view that whatever consciousness is, has to involve that. It's something that we don't know because although we have a procedure in quantum mechanics which is to change the, the state that you evolve from the Schrodinger equation to a system of probabilities, that needs a theory. And that theory is missing. But I have various reasons to believe that the nature of that theory had to involve how general Einstein's general theory of relativity, the theory of gravity, curved space-time, um, how that comes in and changes the nature of quantum mechanics. And from this, sort of looking at this rather carefully, I concluded that the process of the reduction of the state, that's um, how the Schrodinger state goes to probabilities, and it simply jumps. The way we use it, <laughs> the, the state simply jumps from one thing to another, where it looks a little crazy. But the idea is that there should be some underlying theory. But all I was able to find at that stage was a sort of a connection between the displacement of mass, which goes on in, in, in the evolution of a system, and a time scale that that could survive for. And so the idea is that the state, people call it the collapse of the wave function, but the state would make this decision to do one thing or another or another um, at a certain time scale. And that was the one thing one could get out of this. But the idea was that in the brain, this is the place where um, this jump, if you like, one state to another, is governed by some non-computational rules, which we don't understand yet, but that consciousness depends on that very process. And so uh, I said this in my book, The Emperor's New Mind. Oh, the criterion changed a bit from that yeah. book till the next book. So um, with the advent of quantum computing, perhaps computers could eventually reach a s comparable state of consciousness to humans. Well, you see, the, the point here is that it's actually beyond <laughs> c 
See, quantum computing, as we understand it, depends on quantum mechanics, as we understand it. And that does not involve a theory of this reduction of the state. So the ideas that I'm suggesting here is that even quantum computing will not be it. It has to be something where these things start to break down and the quantum state doesn't evolve in the way we think it does. And so you have to... You see, in the brain, you have it's a real challenge, you can see. In the brain, you've got to have a system which does evolve essentially quantum mechanically, but in a coherent way, so that when you do the next step, which is this reduction of the state, I call it OR. OR is the Objective Reduction of the State. And this is an acronym which is a convenient one because it says OR, rather than saying these things which seem to happen all at once in quantum mechanics. It's one OR, the other. So it's the OR point which we're looking at. And then uh, Stuart, Hammeroff, Stuart Hammeroff told me about microtubules, which I'd never heard of. So those who are not familiar, Ork OR is the theory in conjunction with Stuart Hammeroff, and it stands for Orchestrated Objective Reduction. So I just want to touch upon, I read your obituary in The Guardian for Stephen Hawking. It was very touching. And you were, you were quite close to him. I believe you were uh, his professor. And no, you, uh, I was one of his... Well, I, Mental, I collaborated maybe. with him, mm. but I, I was one of his examiners for his, for okay. his PhD. And then you wrote um, some of his first papers he wrote with you? Yeah, two, t- basically two papers. Okay, yes. and then um, he went on to continue with the work on rel- relativity and especially black holes, and you went on to work on many diverse areas such as Penrose tiling and consciousness. Um, can I ask you, what, in your opinion, is the most profound discovery in science Profound discovery in science. Altogether, you mean, over the whole of human history? your personal... Oh, mine. Oh, gosh. (laughs) Well, it's probably not the one that's so well-known, because it doesn't really relate directly either to... Well, it does relate to general relativity, but not in a way which uh, has emerged until very recently. It's a thing called twister theory. And I've been developing this as a way of looking at physics from an unusual perspective. The idea is that space time is some is a secondary notion and it comes about from something else what's what I call twister space and you can think of it in a sort of beginning way <laughs> it's more there's a lot more to it than that as a, a sort of instead of thinking of points you see a point is the basic element of a, of a of a manifold of space space time you consider well in that case it's points which are called events so they have no spatial dimension and no temporal dimension either so they're blips in time as well but these things are what the space-time manifolds are built from if you like but the view here is you don't build it from those you build it from basically light rays so it's the entire you imagine a light ray going on forever in both directions it's just a yeah, mathematical idealization of what light actually does but it's got a kind of twist to it as well which has to do with the spin of the photon so you you this theory ties in uh, very naturally, which is the idea, basically, with the mathematics of complex numbers. Now, you see, I've always been fascinated by the mathematics of complex numbers. That way you have the square root of minus one. And it makes a much more beautiful and coherent theory than the mathematics of real numbers. And there's magic in it, which seems to be unbelievable at the right spots. And so it always seemed to me that this could w- really be... W- the basis of what physical actions, yeah. which we know to some degree is true in quantum mechanics, but this is going further than that, and it's relating the structure of space, space-time, to these kinds of numbers as well as in quantum mechanics. I asked you a question in Switzerland two years ago. Uh, basically, I, I'm a fan of the holographic universe theory, which Edward Witten, the, the mathematician, the mathematical physicist that devised M-theory, amalgamating the five existing versions of string theory into one. He's now working on it with Juan Maldejena and they're making rapid progress and they claim that we'll reach a theory of everything, reconciling relativity and quantum theory in the next 20 to 30 years, but consciousness will forever remain a mystery to mankind. I agree on that front, but what do you think about um, string theory and whether they'll be able to reconcile quantum theory and relativity? Well, I think the initial ideas of string theory were very attractive and I, it was certainly appealed to me. But when they found the necessity, at least in the way the theory developed, for the number of space dimensions to increase, 
well, space-time dimensions to increase from four to initially 26, and then they got it down to 10, and then it became 11 in M theory, and, and it's all a little obscure. But these things, to me, don't really make sense in a deep way. They can make sense as mathematical theories, but to relate them to the physical world, uh, there are reasons for really being doubtful about this. Mm -hmm. So although there's a lot of in interesting stuff going on and a lot of very clever mathematics, and uh, there's no doubt about that, I don't really believe that it is where physics is going. I think and there doesn't seem to be a shred of evidence for any of it. No, that's true. <laughs> yeah. No, there's no physical evidence for it. I mean, a lot of mathematical support in that it's influenced mathematical ideas in very positive ways, but there's no evidence whatever that it, it relates to, to the physical world in a, in a serious way. I got in a discussion <laughs> two years ago with Deepak Chopra where... Um, I, s I said that it might it might be true that the deeper we mine into the fabric of reality and consciousness, the greater we seem to extend its fractal geometric complexity. So there may not be a baseline to reality. It might just be fractal and infinite. Well, that's another way of looking at things. I, I haven't seen fractals really playing a big role, not, not in the way I've looked at physics. Conceivably, there's something a bit like that in the, in the singularities in black holes, but they don't do much uh, as much good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you.